Hello, Bowling fans. This is Dustin J. Mark with coming to you taped, as always, from the gem along the Colorado River, Fort Mojave, Arizona, here in Elite Pro Shop, to bring you yet another rendition of Bowling Evolved. And joining me, as always, is my partner in crime. He's the five-time PBA national champion, the man with the golden left hand, and some people call him the Southern Dandy. I don't know. I thought that was kind of strange, but the one and only Eric Forkel. Eric, how are you doing today? Good morning, partner. <laughs> <laughs> that was nice. Uh, you know, I, I got to say, it, we're, you, you're, you're so uh, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Like I said, I think you're used to this A-Squad stuff again. I'm telling you. I'm thinking I'm digging the morning sessions that we're doing, and uh, it, fits, it fits perfectly. And here we are for another interesting show, and uh, we'll see how it goes. Absolutely. I want to say again, thank you to all of our listeners. We've had a nice little return, a lot of very, very positive comments from our fans in the past, and we've actually gained in the last month since we've actually gotten back on the airwaves in a consistent format, like 40 or 50 likes on our Facebook page, including one of our directors in Johnny Campos, which I thought was kind of interesting. Wasn't he around also when you were still out on tour, if I'm not mistaken, Eric? He was. Johnny was... uh... You know, he, I believe he started off in the press, and then he worked his way into the uh, tournament director's position. And, you know, a pretty decent bowler himself back in the Peoria, Illinois area. Uh, he's just a great guy. And uh, I, I catch him at Bowl Expo when it's here in Vegas. And um, he's, uh, he's he still follows things quite well, and uh, I should say quite often. And um, actually, he'd be a fun guy to ever get on this show. I'm sure he's got some terrific stories. I'd love to have him on. I believe he did take over when Harry Golden decided to retire. And he seems like a a very nice individual, has very kind words to say about the show. So, yeah, we'll have to have him on. But, of course, we do have a very interesting guest today as well, who actually is the man currently in charge of our Facebook website page. He is the world-renowned author, formerly of the L.A. Times, Chicago Tribune, book writer, just about everything bowling writing nowadays, one of our very good friends and truly a phenomenal bowling journalist, the one and only Fred Eisenhammer. Fred, thank you for joining us this morning. Oh, thank you for inviting me. You know, it's always a pleasure to be with you two guys. Fred, it's always great to have you. I know we've had many a conversation, and uh, I can always count on you to get the things on my mind that I want to get out there. All right, thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to it. <laughs> sometimes sometimes they're good. Sometimes they're good. Sometimes they're not so good, but at least I know I can <laughs> <laughs> I know I can have you uh get it out there in a in a nice in a much better way than I would, a much more politically correct way than I would. <laughs> you do a pretty good job yourself. You do a great job. I know myself. Sometimes I get a little crazy. <laughs> get a little crazy. You know the craziness is enjoyed. You know, uh, you know the craziness is enjoyed by by a lot of fans, and uh, same here. Um, you're quite a character, and the same with Dustin. And uh, you know the Glenn Allison show that was just posted was just uh, uh, symbolic of that. Just a great, great bowling show. Not just a show, or not, not just a bowling show, but a great show. And uh, you know, you have to wonder how many people actually listen to it. I mean, with all the shares that that uh, that got, and uh, and the and the personality of Glenn Ellis and everything he's accomplished, and how he's he'll be forever in the news ever since 1962, July 1st or 1982, I should say, July 1st when he bowled the 900 series. I mean, you guys captured the essence, and uh, and a lot of people plugged into that and listened to it, and that that had to rank as one of the biggest. Uh, I think shows that you've ever had, don't you think? Yeah, yeah I, I, I thought I think definitely. Um, you know, uh, Dustin's obviously good friends with Glenn, his family, and and what have you. And I've known Glenn on and off through the years. And anytime you can have a, basically an icon, um, a, a legend, a living legend, on the show for what he has done in the game, and uh, it, it it was fabulous and. He's still pretty sharp, you know. I know he's in his 80s, but he's still pretty sharp. He still follows things. Actually, he still even bowls. 
Uh, care average is 200. I'd like to at least be walking by then. Uh, he's just um, he, he's a character, and uh, he's just a, a good old a good old guy to have on the show, and it it just fit. It was it's like it's like apple pie. It's just you know it's just just wonderful having him on. Bowls still works. Average is 200. Um, amazing person. Glenn is definitely one of those guys that even though we are going further and further on in the revolu- or evolution, I should say, evolution of bowling, that there's only a handful of people that can really talk about legitimately the different eras of bowling, going back as far as the beer teams, through the birth of the PBA, through the change in equipment from rubber to plastic to urethane to reactive urethane, and Glenn experienced all that. I know I had talked to, talked to him not too long after the show had posted, and just to say thank you for doing the show and to touch base again. And he was telling me, me that it was nice that when he went into work, he had a lot of people coming up to the control desk there and saying that they had saw the show and had listened to it, which made me feel good because it's it's rewarding to know that, you know, we don't do Bowling Evolve just to hear our soul talk. Maybe Eric, I don't know. But... <laughs> But no, I I wind up ta- I, I wind up talking to myself all the time, and I don't need this to make sure that I'm talking to myself. <laughs> trust me. <laughs> you know, we started bowling evolved as just a way to express some different opinions on bowling from realistically two people that have very unique perspectives. Obviously, as I said many times, Eric from the professional end, being a national champion, traveling the world. Myself from more of the local end, being a tournament quarter, growing up in the bowling industry my entire life. And frankly, when you are able to have someone such as a Glenn Allison tell you that it's a, you know, that he has people coming up to him telling him how great it was to hear his voice on the show, that we were able to give something back to the bowling community, and that's what makes it worth it. You know, it's not about money. It's not about prestige. It's not about fame. It's simply about entertaining and making people think. And I think if you can influence one bowler out there to change their opinion or to formulate their own opinions about the sport, which, as we all know, it's one of the hardest things in the world is to get someone to change their mind about something or to learn more about something, it's definitely worth it. And I think, again, I want to shout out to all of our fans. If it's not for you guys, none of this would be possible. And so thank you. And, of course, with that being said, I also got to say a big thank you to Fred. Now, Fred, You've taken over the Facebook page. You've put up some incredible stories, different videos, things over the last few years, including a very well-received article on Glenn Allison, which I believe is going to be in the California Bowling News. And, Fred, what's on tap? I mean, what do we got in the future coming up? What uh, what else do you see coming? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, You did the the story on Glenn Allison because, uh, you know, I always have a few stories in mind. I want to talk about uh, some of the older bowlers who have accomplished so much. And uh, I just posted a story on uh, Bowling Evolved about uh, two bowlers who were, one was 80 and the other, and, and his partner was 69. And they won a doubles no tap handicap tournament. And I <laughs> thought this was just fantastic. I mean, that, uh, you know, at 80 and 69, you know, that you can combine forces and win a tournament. And I know it's handicap and you have extra points, but uh, still this tournament had a lot of uh, 220 bowlers in there. And, and uh, you know, they can, they can be a little intimidating. I mean, it's like bowling in the same uh, tournament as Eric Forkel. I mean, uh, come on. I mean, that could kind of give you a little uh, jitteriness. But uh, so <laughs> I'm, do- I'm doing a story about bowlers who are still thriving as they've gotten older. And one, uh, in fact, one of my teammates in my league bowled his first 600 series. He's about, he's 68 years old, and that's quite an accomplishment. You can set a personal best um, at 68. And I think it gives a lot of hope and inspiration to people who are, you know, getting older. I mean, we're all getting older, and uh, you can still take part in a sport and still be competitive and still feel good about yourself. And you can still just uh, be happy that you that you're accomplishing things, and not to mention, and when you go out to the bowling alley, think of all the people you meet, the social activity. It, it's just a great way of spending a night. You know, in league uh, activity, you're meeting. You know, there's 11, 12 other teams bowling next to you, and all the people you have a chance to meet. 
it's it's a great opportunity, and it's nice to be not to be shut out of that just because you get a little little older. And uh, and it's also nice, you know, in the in the same vein, the PBA, you know, the uh, they they have this PBA senior tournament that also allows people when they get older to be in a competitive situation. And uh, you know, Glenn Allison was in that, wasn't he? He was in the you know, quite a few of the senior tournaments. and uh, he Oh, no, you're absolutely correct. I mean, that was the greatest thing for, let's say, you know, people who when they were younger, they had a family, they worked, and then when they turned 50, they could actually uh, go after that other goal of theirs to be a PBA champion, and the PBA Senior Tour was a terrific venue for it, especially when they had, especially when it was on the, um, ESPN every week, when they had an actual live show every week for 20, 20 some odd weeks during the summer. I mean, it was fabulous for that, and it was very popular. Uh, now it's changed quite a bit, obviously, but it's still available. It's just not as, to me, it's not as great as it was back in the 80s and 90s. It was, um, the senior tour was, was, was flourishing in the 90s, in my opinion, and uh, they were on TV just as much as the guys on the regular tour because I used to watch them when we were out there. Now, the Senior Tour is obviously very tremendous right now, and I would arguably say this is the strongest Senior Tour we've ever seen in the history of its existence because you also have 20, 30, 40 guys out there that are national champions that still participate on the regular tour and are still winning on the regular tour. But, Eric, I think you hit a nail on the head when you said that it is different. Right now we are watching the equivalent of the World Series for Seniors as so – so eloquently put in one of the articles I had read earlier, and I forget who actually had wrote that, but they are bowling on the reduced version of the World Series where they're bowling on the different patterns, and we actually had a chance to see a couple stories in the news, including both <clears throat> Pete Weber and Walter Ray Williams attempting to win 100 titles in their career. That's, of course, a combination of regional, national, and PBA 50 titles. But what I thought was very interesting was that even though the world championship is considered a national title, the pattern titles, which on the regular World Series of Bowling, which are considered national champions as well if you win one pattern tournaments, in the senior event, it's only considered a regional title. Now, Eric, I'll throw this over to you. A title is a title. I would definitely agree with that. I mean, I think it's very prestigious to win a regional title. But if you're participating in an event like this, wouldn't you think that they would be considered national titles too since you're bowling against the same bowlers in every event? Well, you would think so, but, uh, you know, what they have done in the last so many years is they'll have these national senior events and they'll put all these small senior regionals around them to help generate more guys to come bowl. Um, I mean, sure, absolutely, the competition is exactly the same, but I think it has something to do with the amount of games because normally they bowl uh, two eight-game blocks of qualifying, and I believe in this thing in Minnesota, they're only bowling two five-game blocks of qualifying and then a modified finals version. So I'm thinking it's the amount of games. I think you have to have maybe so many games to qualify for a national event title. That would be my guess. You could probably check with the PBA on that if, if you'd like, but I think that has something to do with it. And I think it's just the amount of games, if I had to guess, because – a lot of these regionals, if you bowl, you bowl eight games, and then they take the top 16, what have you. Well, if you bowl eight games and then you had an elimination bracket, maybe your total games is, uh, I don't know, 13, 14 games. And I don't, th- I, I don't think that's enough to classify as a national title. So that would be my guess is the reason why these other events are only going to be called regional titles as opposed to a national title, even though when you when you try to win any of those events and those guys are there, it's you're bowling against the Hall of Famers. And they should rename it the PBA Senior Hall of Fame Tour because that's what it is. That's exactly that's exactly what it is. You you have to yeah. beat a Hall of Famer to win. You're not you're not going to almost. I can almost guarantee you in that final match you're going to have at least one Hall of Famer in it. It's been that way for the last couple of years now. Um, and, and years ago, it wasn't like that. It just wasn't like that years ago. But then again, years ago on the senior tour, it was a different group out there. The guys out there would bowl, go in the bar, sing karaoke, 
go play golf in between, and then they would kind of bowl on the side. I mean, they were out there for different reasons. Now everybody's out there. Those guys are still trying to make some money. It's a completely different mindset. A lot of those guys are still on the regular tour. They're still bowling on, on, the, on the, you know, the normal tour, the abbreviated normal tour, I guess you'd say. And they use the senior tour to supplement their income as well. So it's not, it's not a, a vacation. It's not a luxury. It's not going hanging out with the guys like it used to be back in the 90s. Um, it has changed completely. And, you know, that's pretty much the main reason why I think they've given the seniors who are 60 and over, they're giving them extra checks. They're trying to keep them around because they got to battle against all the Hall of Famers every week. And, you know, to keep the tour going, they've created different spots for them in the finals. So if you're over 60, you can almost double dip. You, there's two ways to make the finals every week as opposed to just one. So they're trying to make these guys stick around, give them a little extra money to bowl for, but then again, help keep it going. And all that does is basically line the pockets of the bowlers, all the Hall of Famers who just turned 50. <laughs> That's just the way it is. Yes. And it's – I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that you're starting to see a few of these super senior tournaments pop up, the PBA 60 as they put out there. I actually think yeah. that it's it, – it is a great way to keep the bowlers interested. I do think it's a, it is a little odd that it is considered a regional title, although I, I understand your, your explanation yeah. with the games. Still, though, if I'm going out there and I'm still bowling – you know, Norm Duke and Pete Weber and Walter Ray Williams Jr. and Parker Bowen, and I'm only getting my credit for a regional title. I, I don't know. I, there might be a, a little bit of a, a I don't want to say resentment, but there obviously a, you, you feel that you've competed on the highest level possible. And, of course, I'll throw that out to the fans. I mean, what do you guys think? Write in the Bowling Evolve. Go to our Facebook page, BowlingEvolve.com. Tell us what you think. Should they have gone a national title? That's a good question. Also, of course, the winners of the tournaments were <clears> – <throat> Walter Ray Williams Jr., Parker Bowen III, and Brian Kretzer, which Brian, I believe, was a one-time PBA titleist, just turned into the uh, PBA Senior Tour this year, so possibly a Rookie of the Year. Uh, uh, you know, who knows what's going on. I think the MVP of the Senior Tour is going to be Pete Weber, without a shadow of a doubt, but that puts Walter Ray Williams at 99 titles going into the World Championship, and I don't know, Eric, I, 100 titles in a career, that's that's an amazing feat. Oh, no, it is, um, obviously. But, you know, Walter is, uh, you know, some people say he's the GOAT. I mean, the greatest of all time. And uh, it's kind of hard to not agree with that. But there are certain people who will not agree with that. But uh, getting back to what you said earlier, um, you mentioned Brian Kretzer. Interesting story about Brian Kretzer. He just turned 50 this uh, so many months ago. And he had – Previous to that, he had dropped his PBA card, but when he turned 50, he rejoined the PBA because he wanted to obviously go bowl the senior tour, and he's won a couple of senior regionals. He's finished high in all the events he's bowled, and now he won what they call a senior regional back there at the, the Mini World Series. So obviously turning 50 for him is a bit of a rebirth, and that's exactly what the guys who turn 50, it, it kind of gives them a, 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 a it gives them a, re, a reboot of the whole thing, and they really, obviously, he, he rejoined because of it. So it was good for the PBA because they got his membership back, and uh, he was able to fulfill some more of his bowling dreams, uh, and that's obviously to compete again with the guys and and be successful and make a few bucks on the side. Yes. Yes. And I would also say that with the recent events with the USBC National Championship, that it's good to see that they're still attracting some of the members to come back. And as you said, being 50 was a rebirth for him. And hopefully it will be with the new PBA 60 events that are going on. And, and I believe next year they have a few of them on the books. Or I think there was only one or maybe two this year, but I believe there's three next year. I, I'd have to double check on the schedule. But Hopefully, I will continue to draw the older bowlers back in. Now, Fred, I'm going to throw a question over to you. And with the light of the PBA events and you being more, not necessarily of the pro caliber bowler, but as someone that follows bowling as a fan of bowling, what is the interesting story here for you? Should, should they have been national titles? Should they have been regional titles? 
or it doesn't really matter to you as a fan? Do you just enjoy hearing about the bowling? Well, you know, I love watching the. Well, you know, I love watching the uh, the senior uh, tour, and uh, whether it's on TV or person or how, however, and you know, uh, I'm a little surprised actually. I wasn't aware of that to be honest. That uh, they're only given uh, regional credit for championships. That's kind of surprising when you consider the level of competition. I mean, you go into the uh, into one of these senior competitions and. You know, it's like when Eric is back on the PBA tour, he always talks about he's facing the same people, the same level of competitors. <laughs> I mean, that's a great group of bowlers. I mean, you know, I still remember, I don't know if I can tell this on the, tell this, say this story, but when I was, uh, when I went to a, uh, um, watch one of the, uh, the senior tour, um, events in Orange County, and I saw Eric there and, and, uh, rooting him on, I walked into the bathroom, and who was there? It was Pete Weber. Wow. <laughs> I was excited to see <laughs> Weber in the bathroom with me. And, uh, you know, these guys are, are, are um, just celebrities and, and talented. And uh, it's, uh, you know, you're, you're bowling against such cream, such awesome bowlers. Uh, and, you know, they turned 50. Um, they're still, you know, bowling at the top of their game. Yeah, I, yeah, I keep talking to Eric about this. He wins tournaments, and uh, and I ask Eric, is this the best you ever bowled? And, and and Eric says, well, you know, it could be, it could be, and he's in his fifties. I mean, you expect uh, some kind of a drop off, but uh, you know, if you work at it, and and I don't know what what it what it requires to sustain that level of excellence. But uh, that's just a demonstration of how great these bowlers are in their 50s, even in their 60s. They, uh, you know, they don't have the revs, as Eric would always say, sometimes as some of these uh, young phenoms who come out in their 20s. But, uh, you know, they still they know how to bowl. I mean, you know, Dustin, we, you know, I talked to you about how when I saw Eric Bull for the first time, I was so impressed. He doesn't try to, to shatter the pins. He doesn't try to, uh, you know, blast them. He has this nice, easy stroke. And uh, I think that's what maybe uh, that's one of the secrets is, uh, you know, you, you stay, you know, you're not, you don't get exhausted in this nice, easy stroke. You think so, Eric and, and Dustin? Well, that's an interesting. That's an interesting point. I mean, that's something we've talked about when it comes to the two-handed bowlers. Um, right, right. Obviously, it, it's pretty much of a phenom, phenom nowadays, and it's prevalent. And when you watch kids bowl, a lot of kids bowl with a two-handed style. They teach the two-handed style. But I always wonder, when you get into your 50s and 60s, will you be able to continue with a two-handed style? Whereas the more traditional one-handed style – Obviously, you can bowl in your 50s, 60s, 70s, and Glen Allison into your 80s. So, you know, it's a longevity thing. And the simpler your game is, the easier it is on the body, besides just normal wear and tear to get old. Mind you, I've got to stretch way more than I used to, try to ride the bike to keep my legs okay, try not to deal with all the problems that come for just getting older. But longevity, I mean, for instance, who impresses me the actual most at his age, Parker, who's 53 years old, he throws the ball just as hard as he did when he was in his 20s. I mean, if you watch his game from now and 20, 30 years ago, he looks almost the same. And, you know, as you get older, most people slow down. I mean, that's quite normal. Uh, not him. So there are a few what I call freaks of nature. He's one of them. But greatness, great bowlers, whether they're great when they're in their 30s and 40s, they're going to be great in their 50s and 60s. You just, it's just, when you're a great player or a great bowler, uh, Norm Duke and all the rest of them, Walter, it just doesn't, it doesn't leave you unless something seriously happens to your body. Uh, a bad accident, a serious illness. You've bowled so many, I mean, Johnny Petraglia, he's 69 years old and he's still very competitive out there and he's almost 70 and I mean, he is, Another phen phen phenom. He's won in all these different decades. I mean, talk about 
uh, uh, unbelievable career. And, you know, he, he still bowls terrific. Uh, and he's almost 70, which guys like me who are 55, it gives me hope. I'm like, wow, I got at least another good 10 years to go. So, <laughs> you know, so there's just, that's the beautiful part of the game or sport is longevity. Um, it's unique. It's not that you have to be so super strong, although there are some bowlers like Amleto, who is incredibly great workout shape. He, he, he bowls like a 20, 30-year-old himself because of the great shape he keeps himself in. So obviously the better shape you keep yourself in. I know Glenn Allison swims three, four times a week. He, that, that helps keep him in his bowl, in bowling shape. So whatever you can do physically as you get older, if you love to bowl, then you need to do something to help you bowl as so you can bowl forever pretty much. Um, there's ways of doing it. It's a lot of hard work. Trust me, it has not gotten easier to stay competitive because when I bowl, all I do is bowl against the younger kids in general, and every now and then I'll bowl against some seniors. But it's hard because you got to play. You know, you gotta, you're playing against all the young kids who throw it faster with all the revs, etc. And it's definitely a challenge. But when you're a, a good player and you've you've been around a long time, you have a lot of experience. And a lot of times experience gets you through. And today's game, with all as, as you know, with all the bowling balls and the, the way they make them nowadays, you don't necessarily have to put a lot of revs on the ball to be overly successful. You can just be yourself and let the, let the equipment do all the work. It's, it's turned into a bit of an equipment game. Uh, it's been that way for years. And knowing what balls to throw, when to throw them, that's where the experience comes in. And... Sometimes being a little bit older helps you in that. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it's also, as far as looking at bowlers and longevity, when I was growing up, and I've told the story before, but Eric was actually one of the guys I used to love watching bowl. There were guys like Eric, Norm Duke, <clears throat> David Ozio that had very good fundamentals in their game. And I tried to model my own delivery around that, now, obviously, all three bowlers are much different. Everyone develops their own styles. But the idea about being able to just repeat shots is one of the most important things in the world. And I think Eric talks about this uh, very well, is that when you look at a lot of the people that have tried converting styles, or I, I mentioned one bowler there's out here that I believe he's in his early 70s, and he recently started doing two-handed bowling. The reason is he had double carpal tunnel surgery, so he can't hold on to the ball with one hand anymore. But it's so tough on his body to do the two-handed bowling that he's actually started doing more swimming and also doing some core exercises, push-ups, and things of that nature to help build up his upper back. But I think you can do any style within reason as long as you're able to keep yourself healthy. I know... When I look at guys like, again, Johnny Petragula is an excellent example. Here's a guy that really hasn't changed much in his game over the last 40 years, but yet is still able to do and compete just as well as anyone else. I mean, the big story was was two years ago when he was making a run at the regular Masters, which I think was an incredible feat in his age. So, no, it's it's really an amazing and awesome accomplishment for any bowler to be able to have that longevity and to hear a guy like, for example, Glenn Allison at 86 years old using a conventional bowling ball is still able to average 200 in a league. Uh, as Eric said, if I can walk at 86, I'm going to be a happy camper. <laughs> so. And that's part of, and that's the interesting and the uniqueness part of the game. And uh, that's what that's where the stories come from. That's where the personalities come from, and that's why. People are, that's the fascinating part of what we do. Um, You don't have to be the biggest, the fastest, the strongest. You you just have to be, it's a very unique skill to be a world-class bowler. Um, Again, compared to all the other sports, there's a uniqueness involved. There are some people who keep themselves in great shape, like I mentioned, but most of them are just average, your average looking guy, your average person. You know, and there's nothing, but they have a unique ability to be able to to, to throw a bowling ball, whether it's right handed or left handed, whatever, uh, and and just be good at it. It's it's a very unique skill. It, it just is. It's to me, it's maybe of similarity to golf. 
um, in the regards where you don't have to be the strongest and the fastest and what have you, even though golfers nowadays are much younger, they're in better shape than ever, say 20, 25 years ago, pre-Tiger, um, you know, it's changed in that regard too, but um, that's the that's the great part about bowling, and hopefully that's what keeps people bowling because you can bowl all the way up into your 80s, and actually even into into your 90s, there are people who bowl in their early 90s. Um, so uh, you can play the game forever, and that's the that's a great selling point of the game. Certainly. Now, that is going to take us in towards the end of our show. I do want to say again, thank you to all of our listeners, and of course, thank you to Fred Eisenham for coming on the show. Again, check out the BowlingEvolved.com webpage. takes you to our Facebook page updated several times a week with different videos, stories, articles. And one of the biggest dropping news, which will be coming in at the end of next month, Bowling Evolve will be hosting another tournament, which we have not hosted a tournament since the Laughlin Cup. And, Eric, I think this is going to be an exciting one. We're taking a page out of one of our favorite tournament formats, which is doubles bowling, and we're going to be doing the two-by-four. Four games across eight lanes. We're going to have two squads before cutting to the top four bowlers, who will be bowling a Baker match eliminate uh, Baker step ladder match elimination, which will be broadcasting on BowlingEvolve.com, hosted of course by Don Laughlin's Riverside Lanes in Laughlin, Nevada, sponsored by our friends at Mongoose Bowling Products, Steve Adams, MongooseProducts.com, and of course Elite Pro Shop, EliteProShopAZ.com. Eric, I'm really excited for this one. I think it's going to be a fun format, and I think we're going to have a lot of really good players come down for this one. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it as well. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure you're going to have a senior division, right? <laughs> <laughs> for, 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 for you, it's going to be the super senior division. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Uh, I, I, I'm just, I, like I said, I bowl against the, the younger generation all the time here in Vegas, and uh, I, I don't think the pins know how old anybody is. Uh, all they, So I'll be more than willing to show up, and I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be fantastic. I will tell right now we will have a flyer coming out here at the end of August. We will have more information coming up on the Bowling Evolve Facebook page, of course. Uh, space will be limited. Again, we will be running two squads, so we get those entries in early. I will say as of right now, we are going to be guaranteeing $1,000 on top in this tournament. So definitely a fun little event for people to come down. And the other part that some people may like, some people might like, it will be a handicap event, 100% of 210. Although it is not necessarily a scratch event, I still think it's going to be a tremendous bowling tournament, and it's going to attract a lot of different people to come out and bowl. Plus, I want to see who's going to make our stepladder final, because I think that is going to be one heck of a show at the end. Well, I know one thing. I'm going to be on the stepladder finals either way. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you and I both, uh, we might be behind the microphone, but we're going to be there. <laughs> I said I'm going to I'm going to make that show either way, so I'm feeling pretty good about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> tremendous. But again, that is taking us into the end of the show. Once again, we've had a tremendous last three shows, now our fourth show. We are on some kind of streak. I don't know what's going on. Maybe we maybe we're sick. I don't know. One of the something like that, but <laughs> Again, big thank you to Fred Eisenhammer, to all of our friends that have liked us. Please check out BullyingEvolved.com. That is our Facebook page. And also check us out on our YouTube page. Like, comment, subscribe. Remember, this show is for real bowlers by real bowlers. So if there's something you guys want to see, a guest you want us to have on, things you want us to talk about, please let us know. Coming up in the near future, we will also be having on Scott Wilbur, owner of Motive Bowling. He's promised to talk a little bit about the new products that are coming out as far as the Motive line goes, and some news possibly on the Motive Jackal, the controversy with the USBC, what can be expected or what he can talk about. We're not going to press him too much, or maybe we will. We don't know. Wink, wink. But with that being said, for all of us here, I've been Dustin J. Markowitz. Have a great night. Or good morning. You know what? It's morning. you got to get with the morning. It's no more night. So just have a great day. <laughs>